Learn how to use and get the most out of granulating watercolors and learn how to mix Potter's Pink if you don't have it on hand. Hi, I'm Amber Rain Davis from NotableInk.com. Welcome back to the channel. If you're regular followers, then you've seen these stamp sets before. This is my first two stamp sets, Fur Branch and Nature Bobbles. These are back in stock, so if you miss these before they sold out, then you can get them now. And I'm selling them individually or also as a bundle for 10% off. I'll have a link to the shop up above and a link to all the supplies that I use in today's video down in the video description below. I chose two of the bobble stamps and you can see that these are well loved. They already have some staining on them because I've used them with some stays on inks and those tend to stain, but that doesn't affect how the stamp sets work. You can certainly choose to overlap these. I don't love masking, so I tend to not overlap them. I'm gonna stamp these in a soft brown color. Now, I wanna do some no-line water coloring so I am going to stamp this with a dye ink. Now, if you want the lines to completely go away, then what I would suggest is a distress ink or a distress oxide ink because those will completely melt away, whereas your dye inks will stay around, but because I'm using a light color, you won't see them as much. The reason I chose a dye ink is because I wanna keep some of the structure of those leaves. Here I'm just showing you that I'm using my Letter Sparrow um, watercolors here along with Sedona Genuine from Daniel Smith. Um, the Letter Sparrow colors that I'm using, you can see that I have them all swatched out here. Rare Green Earth is also Daniel Smith. You certainly don't have to use these brands. Use what you have, use the colors that you have. I have a piece of cold press watercolor paper here. I love cold press because it has all of that beautiful texture to the paper and that works really well for granulating paints. I'm putting down a layer of clean clear water and then I'm going to drop light yellow ochre into that paint. Now, as I'm doing this, let's talk a little bit more about what exactly is a granulating paint. A granulating paint or watercolor paint specifically is one where the pigments clump together, creating an uneven and mottled texture on the paper. So the difference between a granulating and non-granulating paint, a non-granulating paint is one that goes down really smoothly. There's no texture at all. It's a clean, clear paint. Usually they're very transparent. Um, so one of your non-granulating paints that has that clear, crisp, crisp look are your quinacridones. Um, you've heard me talk about quinacridone paints before. If you're looking for non-granulating, that's the paints that I would go with. Those you can really rely on for being super smooth, bright, and crisp. Granulating paints, though, have such beautiful texture. They're not for everybody. Um, it's really kind of a polarizing watercolor paint uh, because you either love them, some watercolorists avoid them at all cost and look for those clean, clear, crisp, transparent paints that are super smooth like your quinacridones. I, in particular, love the texture. And so a lot of times when I use granulating paints or my watercolors, a lot of times I really like to use rough watercolor paper because it has more of those nooks and crannies and you get a lot more texture with those. So I find that's a way that you can really enhance the look of your granulating paints is with rougher watercolor paper. Now you will still get a granulating appearance with hot press paper too. So those are your smooth watercolor papers. Um, just let me get back to the painting here. So I dropped in Sedona Genuine into the light yellow ochre just to add a little bit of shading. I'll let that dry for a little bit and then I'll come back to that. So here I'm just re-wetting my Potter's Pink and this Potter's Pink is also from Letter Sparrow, which are handmade watercolor paints. Um, they're on the pricey side. This was a gift to myself, you know, a few years ago actually I bought this paint and I really hadn't used it much because I was much more into bright colors, but my likes have really shifted to the more desaturated earthy tones. And so I pulled out this Potter Pink to have a play with it. 
So here you can see that the potter's paint really goes onto the paper unevenly. And so some of your paints are gonna be very easy to mill and, and grind down. So your pigments and the powders, when you grind down the stone or the pigment that it's made from, some of them grind down more smoothly and evenly, and those are gonna be more to your non-granulating paints. Your granulating paints are going to be more challenging to mill down and grind, and so you tend to have a larger particle or more uneven and irregular particles. Now what happens with granulating paints is they get suspended in the water when you rewet them, and as the water starts to evaporate, those heavy irregular pigments will start to settle into the paper. Gravity tends to pull them down into the nooks and crannies of, those pa of the paper, creating this mottled appearance. So if you're going for a smooth wash, you're not going to want a granulating paint. You're going to want maybe one of your quinacridones or one of those transparent paints that are super smooth. If you're doing something that's more organic, maybe you're doing a mountain scene or... Um, variegated leaves or something that has more texture to it, then I would try a granulating paint. So I think you get the best result and you can enhance the granulation of your paint or the appearance of the granulation if you put down that clean, clear water first and then you drop your pigment into the clean, clear water. I think the pigments and those larger irregular bits have more of a chance to be able to clump together so they kind of attract to each other clump together in that suspended water and then as I said as the water starts to evaporate they start to settle down into the paper with that textured look. Here I've mixed some potter's pink with the Sedona Genuine because I wanted to warm this bobble up a little bit. I wanted to have two different colors in here. I'm not going to add a lot of this mixture, but I wanted to add some of that in the shadows. To me, even though it has a lot of granulation and texture, because it's the single color, it just looks very one dimensional to me. And I think warming it up with a slightly different color is going to give it more dimension and more interest. Another thing that I like to do is use mix a little bit of one of the colors with the other two colors that I'm using. So I dropped Sedona Genuine into the yellow ochre and then Sedona Genuine into the potter's pink and it kind of links those together and makes the color palette a little more cohesive. It's not something that you would immediately recognize just with the naked eye or without knowing that I did it, but I think it just makes it that little bit more cohesive and ties things together really well. So on your hot press and cold press paper, because there is kind of a patterned texture to the paper, you may have more of a pattern to your granulation. Whereas on your hot press paper, since it's smooth, you might get more of a random pattern for how your granulation looks because it's just gonna flow around in the water on the surface of the paper and settle into the paper willy-nilly without having that texture and those hills and valleys to fall into, if that makes sense. Um, also, let me just put this out there. I am not an expert on watercolor, you guys. I just like to share with you kind of what my experience has been and what I've found, what works for me. If your experience is different or you know something else to be true, leave me a comment down below and let me know. While you're down there, I would love it if you guys would subscribe and click that bell button if you're enjoying this video so far. I'd love you to come back and visit again. Daniel Smith watercolors are definitely known for their granulating paints. I love Daniel Smith watercolors. Those are among my favorite types of watercolor paints. And again, because I love the granulation effect and the texture and um, their Primatech line in particular is made up of grinding down semi-precious stones. Those stones are incredibly hard in most cases, and so they're more difficult to mill down. They tend to have the larger bits in them. So the majority, if not all, of the Primatex are granulating paints. So here you can see both of these baubles have granulation in them, definitely more in the potter's pink. So 
As I said, so the Sedona Genuine is a Prima Tech paint from Daniel Smith, and it is a granulating paint. And I definitely did see more granulation of the Sedona than I did of the light yellow ochre. So now I'm using Verona Green from Letter Sparrow, and she changed the name of that paint. Now she calls it Terra Vert. It used to be called Verona when I purchased it uh, way back when. I'm also going to add some Rare Green Earth into this as well. Rare Green Earth is a granulating paint, although not nearly as much as the Potter's Pink. So to me, that says that it's more finely milled and that the particles in the Potter's Pink are larger and kind of um, fall into those places more heavily. It granulates more. I'm going to speed up some of this painting. I am using one of my favorite watercolor brushes. These brushes are from Wonder Forest. I know that I've talked about them in lots of my videos. Dana has put out and released two new sets of watercolor brushes. The two new sets of brushes are the Essential Detail Brush Set. So she's scaled things back and gone really small so that you can add in those fine details. And then the Deluxe Watercolor Brush Set where she's scaled things up and gone much larger. So she has a 20 round in there. She has a dagger brush, a flat brush, a large oval mop brush, I believe it's a three quarter, and a cat's tongue brush in there. So some really cool brushes and you'll be seeing those in upcoming videos. I'll use the oval mop brush in today's video closer to the end when I do the background. And I'll put links to those new brush sets down below for you guys as well. I am pretty tough on my brushes and uh, my daughter also watercolors a lot and she uses my brushes as well. One of the things that I do that you should not do is I stick the point of my brush into these pans. And that's because of the container that my paints are in in this particular palette. It's a little bit deeper and so I can't just roll it from the side as easily. But you always want to roll your brush into the paint from the side um, more parallel to the pan rather than perpendicular at the point because you're going to take that nice point on your brush and you're just going to wear it down. So don't do what I do. Um, roll it from the side and you'll preserve that point on your brush much better. Fortunately for me, Wonder Forest does sell their brushes individually now as well, so I can just replace one at a time if I need to. So here I'm just dipping a number two round brush into the Potter's Pink and I'm just adding some contrast to the edges of these little berries. So I put down a light wash first, let that dry, and then I'm coming in with this number two brush. Now, the nice thing about these detail brushes, and this isn't actually from the detail set, there's even smaller detail brushes in the detail set, which is pretty cool, um, is that they don't hold a lot of water. Now, because they don't hold a lot of water, your paint mixture is drier, which means you have more control over it, which means it's going to stay exactly where you put it. So you can come in and put these great details, add a delineated line so that you can separate out these berries because before with just the light wash, they were just all blending in together. So a few years ago when I first started watercoloring, I wouldn't even have attempted to add detail like this or shadow like this. I would have put down those initial washes and then I would have come in with color pencils to add this extra depth and contrast. If you are new to watercolor and you're not comfortable with adding the extra shadows or you feel like um, you don't have control over your water yet and you don't know how wet your brush needs to be and you're creating blooms on your paper, you can certainly try um, adding those details with color pencils until you get more comfortable. It really just takes practice. You know, I, I did the color pencil technique for a long time and I still sometimes add those. In order to make these berries come to life, I'm gonna mix just a little bit of the indigo with the Sedona Genuine to create an earthy brown color. And I'm gonna put a little oval or a circle in each one of these berries, and that's going to add a dimensional component to the berries. So you're gonna be able to see, based on this dot, which way these berries are pointing, and it's just going to add more depth. Also, that dark brown little dot is going to add just enough contrast to bring this whole card to life. It just, you just need just a little bit, but it makes such a huge difference. 
We're almost done with the painting, but definitely hang with me to the end so you can see how to mix Potter's Pink if you don't have it. Here you can see that the leaves on the left still have the lines because I used that dye ink. This is what I was talking about earlier. So if I had used a Distress um, Oxide or a Distress Ink Pad, those lines of the leaves would have completely just dissolved into the pink that I was using and it would look like a big blob. So while I wanted a no line watercolor look, I did want to leave some of the skeleton of those leaves so that they would be delineated and look like separate leaves. Just using a little bit of the rare green earth to add some contrast to these leaves as well. Another thing you should not do, you should definitely not do with your watercolor brushes is mix your colors with one of your detail brushes. Yeah, it's going to ruin your brush eventually. You're going to wear down your brush. So mix your paints with um, kind of another cheaper brush and that will extend the life of your really nice brushes. But yeah, you don't want to mix your paints with a detail brush. That's just crazy. Don't do what I do. So I pulled out the 20 round brush. You can see that this brush is really large. This is from that deluxe watercolor brush that I was talking about. And I'm just gonna add a background here. Now, at this point I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll just add a light pink kind of drippy background and not use the fur branch stamp set. Ultimately, I decided to use the fur branch, but I'm just using some really diluted, um, dusty pink mixture here and just dripping it down the card. It's going to be super light. I didn't want to significantly darken the background and I've sped this up not only because this is already a long video but also because I totally forgot that I was super zoomed in for the painting of the baubles and I was out of screen for most of that so sorry about that. Here I just darkened up that mixture although it's still pretty diluted and I'm just going to add some of that darker gray to the top and just drip that down the card. Of course I decided I needed some splatter so I'm just using that diluted gray, pinkish gray, and I'm going to splatter that on. Now you can see nothing happened in the top left hand corner because it's still super wet up there, but you can see the bottom right hand corner is very dry so we have nice delineated splatters so depending on the look you're going for if you want soft splatters do it while the paper is still wet if you want really distinct splatters do it while the paper is dry i have some two inch post-it note tape here and i'm just going to use this to create some masks for my baubles because ultimately i decided to stamp some of the fur branch background on this so i'm just going to cut that out you don't need to cut it perfectly um, just a rough cut is totally fine and then go ahead and adhere that to your card so here I have the three quarter inch oval mop brush that I talked about earlier. Now your mop brushes are going to hold a lot of water unlike your detail brushes, right? Um, your mop brushes can help you lay down a bunch of water over a larger area, like over your full card front or canvas. And then that is going to enable you to do a beautiful wash of color over the surface. What I wanna do with this is add um, some watercolor paint to my fur branch stamp set. What I ended up doing was adding too much water to this. So I have a lot of water on my brush right now. I should have dried it off a little bit, but I left this in here so you could see my mistake and see how I fixed it. So you can see it's super juicy. I'm gonna go ahead and take a microfiber cloth and blot that up. And then I dried off my paintbrush. I'm dipping it back into the pan to pick up some color, but there's a lot less water on my brush. I'll go ahead and stamp that down. And you do wanna hold it for a few seconds to give the pigments a chance to absorb into the paper and then bring it up. Now you can see the detail of the fur branch, both at the top and the bottom, and that looks a lot better, but it still looks pretty vintage. It's not a perfect stamping. Now, the other way that you can do this is just to ink up your stamp with an ink, ink pad, like normal, spray it with a little bit of water, and you can get a watercolor look that way as well. For me though, the issue that I had with that is I didn't have a green that exactly matched my watercolor paint. And so that's why I used the watercolor and did it this way instead. But either way works perfectly well. I pulled out my ink pads and did a little bit of swinking and swatching on a piece of cardstock just so I could figure out what color I wanted to do my sentiment. 
Ultimately, I decided I didn't want to use a dye ink, which I have on the left. I really wanted to use a pigment ink because I'm stamping on watercolor paper. I love pigment inks for um, sentiment stamps because they stamp so beautifully and clear and crisp. That is especially important when you're stamping on a textured paper. So if I'm stamping on watercolor paper for a sentiment, I truly prefer a pigment ink. I went with this gray because I didn't really have any other colors that would have matched this card. And I totally didn't even line up the stamp, you guys. The H is way too far up. I wanted the tips of the H to overlap the ornament, but I didn't want the center of the H to be right at the bottom of the ornament. So I wasn't even paying attention though, but I still think this looks nice. I did stamp it a second time off screen just to darken it up and check out the granulation on these paints, especially the Potter Pink. I mean, it is like so super granulated and so fun. I love the organic texture there. All right, we have finally gotten to the mixing of Potter's Pink. So this half pan here is my Potter's Pink from Letter Sparrow. And as we've talked about throughout this entire video, we've learned what granulating watercolor paints are how they work, why they settle into the paper, and how you can enhance that, both with putting down a layer of clean, clear water first, and also by using textured watercolor paper. This scrap of paper that I'm using here for the mixing is cold pressed paper, but again, if you really wanted to enhance that look even more, you could use rough paper. I think it's fun to experiment with the watercolor papers that you're using because paints react so differently depending on the paper that you use. Um, what I highly recommend is that you look for 100% cotton paper. And I know I've said this a bunch of times before, but you, if you are really struggling with your watercolor with, and you're not getting the results that you wanna see, Look at changing your paper. Look for 100% cotton. Maybe um, shoot for one that is just a level up from where you are right now in terms of quality and see what kind of results you can get with a higher quality paper. Okay, so this is our Potter's Pink. So what I wanted to do is use some colors. This is Pyro Crimson that um, the three colors that I'm gonna use the first time out are colors that you're going to have in pretty standard watercolor sets that you might get. So I have Burnt Umber here in this little pan at the top. I've used Pyro Crimson, and I'm going to add French Ultramarine to this. If you don't have French Ultramarine in your palette, you probably have Ultramarine, which is very similar. French Ultramarine, some people say granulates slightly more than Ultramarine, but they're very similar paints. The reason I wanted to choose these three colors is not only did I think it would get me to Potter's Pink, but I just feel like they're pretty standard colors that most people have in their watercolor sets. Um, if you don't have Burnt Umber, you could try using a little bit of a warm yellow and see if you can get there that way. Um, you might need to increase a little bit more of the blue or red um, to offset that yellow if it goes too brown. Um, but if you don't have the burnt umber, you can try one of your warm yellows and see how you go. Now I can already tell from seeing this mixture and how it's going down on the page that it's not very granulated, right? So the color is pretty close. There might be a little too much red in there. I probably needed just a touch more of the French ultramarine to get it a little more towards the purple, like the Potter's Pink that we have swatched all the way to the left, but it's not very granulated at all. Not like we already talked about, this Potter's Pink that I have is crazy granulated. So at this point, I was thinking about, okay, these are the standard paints that most people will have. That'll get them pretty close to the Potter's Pink, but what could I use to try and recreate that granulating effect? And I'm gonna show you that next. So just to reiterate, this was the Pyro Crimson, which is your cool red in an essential palette, Burnt Umber, and French Ultramarine. French Ultramarine is a warm blue. So 
If you're someone who doesn't like granulating colors, then good Lord, I'm surprised you stuck with me so long in this video because that's pretty much all we talked about. But this would be a good mixture for you because it's pretty flat. There's not a lot of granulating in it. The granulating would mostly come from just a touch with the French ultramarine and a little with the burnt umber, but it's not super grainy. So I'm gonna start with Pyro Crimson again, which is your cool red. And this time I'm going to use Goethite which is brown ochre. So some people will call it brown ochre. This is a Daniel Smith paint and it's called Goethite. If you can see it, so my swatches up above match my palette down below. This one is a crazy granulated soft brown color. And then I'm switching to cerulean blue, which is a super granulating blue. Now these should get me closer to the granulation that we see in Potter's Pink. Um, you can see it's a little too much on the purple side here. I'm adding just a touch of red. I think I ended up adding a little too much red. Um, we'll take a look at here, here. No, it's still pretty purple. It's a dusky purple. That looks fairly close to what we have on the left. Now, the only thing that I did here that was different than the way we painted, right, is that I didn't add any clean, clear water to my swatch before laying down this paint. So we're not gonna appreciate the granulation in these mixtures as much as we would have if I had laid down a little bit of that clean, clear water first. Even the Potter's Pink that I swatched on the left is not as granulated as what we saw in the card that I just did. So you can see a little bit, but not as much, and you can see a lot less granulation on the second swatch there. So this was Pyro Crimson. Goethite, which is also brown ochre from Daniel Smith, and it's cerulean blue. And in fact, all of the colors that you see in this Daniel Smith palette here, those are all Daniel Smith watercolors there. And what I did there, if you guys have seen my old videos, you might have seen a small palette like this that had 28 colors in it. What I did is create another palette with just these colors that I want to say this has. 18 colors in it. Okay, so I reduced it by 10 colors because as I started to create more watercolor videos, one of the things that I was thinking of is like the majority of people aren't going to have 28 colors, especially if they're just starting out. And so I wanted a more limited palette for my videos so that I would be forced to do more mixing to create the colors that I was going after because I thought that that would be more, more useful for you guys. Here I'm using the same colors and I'm just changing up the mixture a little bit, either adding a little bit more red to this one or a little bit more blue, um, just to change it a little bit and see if we could get it even closer to that original swatch. This time I'm gonna lay down a little bit of that clean clear, well, not really clean because you can see it's discolored a little bit. I'm gonna lay that down first and see if we can get a little more granulation in this swatch compared to the first few. But these are all really close, you guys. So if you don't have Potter's Pink, these are definitely combinations that you can use to get you to that color and hopefully save you a little bit of money so that you don't have to purchase every individual color. The one thing that I will say is if you find a color that you love and you know you're going to be using a lot of it and they sell it already pre-mixed, like Daniel Smith has a color for it, if you're gonna use a lot, buy it because it's, it is a lot easier to have it pre-mixed if you're using a lot of it than to try and mix the same mixture over and over. Because you can see even with these last two swatches, it's the same colors that I use for those, but depending on how much you add of each color, you can have a vastly different color. So rule of thumb, if it's a color you're going to use all the time, buy it pre-mixed. That's what they call a convenience color. It's convenient to have it already mixed up and ready to go. I'll show you a close-up photo of these in just a minute. I just wanted to show you closer cerulean blue so that you can see the granulation on that compared to the French ultramarine that's next to it and the goethite and the pyro crimson. So those are the three colors that we use to mix the last two swatches. And that's going to give you the greater granulated look. For the less granulated, use the French Ultramarine, Pyrrole Crimson, and the Burnt Umber. 
If you don't have pyro crimson, but you have permanent rose, that would be another option. You can also use quinacridone rose. Um, that'll give you an even less granulated color, but just beware, quinacridone rose is a lot brighter and it's super strong, so you might need to dilute it out just a little bit to get closer to this dusky pink. Here you can see a comparison compared to the bobble, and they're all pretty close. One thing you'll note though is with any of the mixtures, we didn't get as much granulation as we did with the single pigment unmixed potter's pink. And that my friends is a wrap on how to use granulating paints, how to get the most out of them, and how to mix potter's pink if you don't have it. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you soon with more inspiration.